to introduce Ron Fatula to our fantastic presentation today in the Great Legal Minds series um, of INBLF. He will be speaking on the topic of trust and estates. He is the New York chapter, our INBLF New York chapter's trust and estates guru. Um, there's so much to say about Ron that I don't even know where to start. But I wanted to let you know that he was recently selected to serve on the Executive Council of the AARP. Um, but he also sits as a co-chair of the Financial Planning and Investment Committee of the Elder Law and Special Needs Section for the New York State Bar Association. So kudos for him. He's also a co-chair of the Board of Directors of the Long Island Alzheimer Association and serves as their chair of their legal counsels. He's also a frequent speaker and author on trust estates, both locally and nationally. So I am now going to turn the floor to a very exciting presentation by my colleague in New York. Ron, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Marcin. And uh, it's good to see Seth from New York. Go New York. <laughs> uh, and uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, look, I thought that this would be a very important presentation. Uh, especially with what's going on. Here in New York, things were really, really ugly for quite a while. Starting in March, early March, the you-know-what hit the fan in New York, and uh, there were so many permutations in, you know, with what was going on with COVID-19 and my elder law uh, practice, you know, in, in New York. And uh, to give you an idea of how this is, this virus has touched, you know, just my firm and myself, aside from doing a ton of, of probate cases, unfortunately, uh, my receptionist that we've had for 18 years, uh, she and her husband got the virus. Her husband passed away a few days after they went into the hospital together. She held on for two months, we actually had a, uh, uh, she looked like she was had, having a turnaround and she was going to be fine and she was going to come back. She was energetic. She had one bad day and she passed away. And this was a couple of weeks ago. So we lost our receptionist. One of my best friends that I have lunch with all the time and, and uh, He's a colleague, he's a, a financial advisor as well. And he, uh, he always said, Ron, you do our documents, but they were a little superstitious, believe it or not. And uh, I get a frantic call from him about six weeks ago. His wife got the virus and she's not doing well. And he's driving off to the, the hospital. Uh, what should he do legally? They were too superstitious to do a will, a trust, powers of attorneys, healthcare proxy, a living will, any of these documents. And uh, then I don't hear from him, I couldn't reach him. His wife goes in, into the hospital, Southside Hospital in, in, on Long Island, on a ventilator, and that was it. He said, what can I do? How can I make decisions? What's going on? And, uh, you know, I guided him through the process she was on a ventilator, had a 20% chance of survival, but she did survive. Awesome. And uh, so these are some of the things that we dealt with. And uh, when I spoke to Jane, and I said, you know, I think it would be a good idea just to talk about some of the basics, or I'm happy to go over even some of the more complicated issues on, you know, how this virus has affected all of us and what we need to do from my point of view, from my elder law, special needs, and people just call me when they get sick. That's what they do. So we have that sort of stress in our practice. Um, so I just want to you know, talk about very important documents that people should have, what planning should take place, especially now with this virus. And uh, you know, everyone really needs to get their, their ducks in a row. And as I made mention very briefly before, you know, the practice is a little slow because of the virus. It's really started to pick up now in the last couple of weeks when we were able to open up. But uh, 
uh, we were very and continue to be very busy doing probate work and uh, and administration work and you know I guess it's good for the bottom line and so we did we're doing well with that but you know it's just it's just so sad to see clients that I've had for years uh, individuals acquaintances that I, I've known pass away I'm doing the probate for my receptionist who passed away after 18 years. It's just been, it's been a horror. And, uh, but we've really coming out of it. Uh, sorry, Marcin, I think you're, you might, I thought you guys in California were coming out. looks like you might be going back into it again, but uh, we're all doing them with the best we can, but it is serious. Take it seriously and uh, just be very careful. So let me go over the, the, important documents. I say there are five very important documents that everyone should have, every adult should have. Uh, number one is a power of attorney. If you should become incapacitated, and how many people do we know? We, you know, we have the Perlmans here, which is so nice to see. How many people do we know in New York that have had the virus, might have been younger, survived, but they were not doing well for a while and couldn't do much, you know, when they were ill. They felt like they were hit in the gut or they couldn't breathe, et cetera, couldn't breathe well, et cetera. You want to appoint someone else in a power of attorney uh, to have them take over for you financially. Not in New York, but in other states. We also have, well, you guys have, but not as in New York, powers of attorneys for healthcare decision making. In New York, we have healthcare proxies, pretty much the same, where you appoint someone else to make your healthcare decisions. Now, I just want to talk about the power of attorney in New York. In New York, you could just download the form for a power of attorney, and uh, it's in our general obligations law. It's a form, but in order to, to really give it teeth for long-term planning, you really need to have Many, many, you need to revise that drastically and add many, many provisions to that power. So in a, you know, in a given situation, we might add anywhere from 20, 50, and even sometimes 75, 80 additional provisions into that standard form power of attorney. So uh, the, the agent on the power could actually do planning. What sort of planning? Medicaid planning for long-term care estate planning. Right now, we have this huge exclusion, almost $12 million a person. The IRS says that if you transfer gift away assets now, uh, it won't count against you at the end of 2025 when you're going to have the level. It won't count against you. So if you use, just for argument's sake, $6 million now in gifts, get that out of your estate, you're still going to have six million dollars or so of an exclusion come the end of 2025. So it's not just Medicaid; it's estate planning. It's all of this. And you know, uh, well, let me just stick with the powers. The powers are very important. The power to gift is important. New York State does not forget, permit gifting beyond five hundred dollars a year unless there's a separate statutory gifts rider attached. And <clears throat> we add all of those extra provisions to the power of attorney, as well as the statutory gifts rider that permits us to give. So why would we want to give? For Medicaid planning, estate planning. We may want to fund a special needs trust for a child or for another relative. Or there could be a spendthrift trust for a child that can't hold on to money. There's so many reasons why we may need that power of attorney. But without the power, a lot of people don't realize it, even some attorneys, uh, just because you might be married to someone doesn't mean you have the authority over their assets. Uh, so in order to basically take hold of those assets, just as my friend frantically called me when his wife was on the, the ventilator and she had a business and she had about 20, has about 20 employees. And he said, 
we need to sign paychecks, we need to do this, we need to do that. You need this document. She's well now, but it actually took her quite a while to get back. And uh, power of attorney, where you appoint someone else to make your financial decisions, and a healthcare proxy, or in some other states, a power of attorney for healthcare decision making is so important. So let me move to the healthcare proxy. Look, we, we're all not gonna live forever. Uh, but because I do the work that I do, I know that not only do we not live forever, but most of the times we don't, what, what happens is not the order that I put in to the guy up above. And I always say, when it's my time to go, I don't care if it's, well, I kind of do care, but if it's tomorrow or if it's in 40 years from now, you know, just let me go in my sleep. But it's not the way it typically happens, uh, you know, uh, and you do want to appoint someone else to make your healthcare decisions for COVID, for non-COVID. I'm dealing with this right now. My, my brother, unfortunately, with my clients all the time, has been in the hospital for weeks. Uh, we have all of his documents and, you know, I'm in touch with his wife on a daily basis, but it's been a, a harrowing time for, for me and my family uh, with regard to my brother. So uh, we hope the outcome is gonna be good. You know, we'll see what happens. Uh, but you need these documents. Things happen, things happen, and uh, you do need to be prepared. Uh, you know, someone asked me, uh, uh, you know, when, when I was speaking about documents that they need, and they, they basically said, you know, it, it's, it, it's sort of like when you love someone, you want to make sure that when you leave this earth, or if you become incapacitated, that's what that power of attorney is all about in the healthcare proxy, uh, you make it easier for someone else. It's an act of love. And, you know, I agreed with that, but I took it one step further. It's, it's actually an act of self-love also. Knowing that you have your affairs in order just makes you feel calmer, number one. But number two, you want to make sure that everything you need to have done will be done by someone that you cherry pick. When you sign up power of attorney, you're picking the one person that you want to have handle your affairs. Uh, you know, it's so interesting. Who did I name on my power of attorney? I have two kids that I love. It's my brother and my eldest son. So I'm going to start to rethink that because my brother is quite ill at this point. So it's a living, breathing document. You're going to want to change it when people become ill, unfortunately pass away, uh, etc. But the documents are very important. But please, just downloading a form may not be good enough. And, uh, you know, when we were talking about Larry, we were talking about Kerry Peck, you know, one of our members from uh, Chicago, who I've known for many, many years uh, through the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. He's a great guy. But, you know, I know in New York, you just download a power of attorney. It's good if you want someone else to sign your checks. It's not good, good enough to do planning, estate planning, Medicaid planning, et cetera. So just be very, very careful with that. Uh, next is a living will. I'm not doing this in order of importance, but a living will is a document in which you set forth what your healthcare wishes are. Obviously, while you're living, what do you wanna have done with your body? So that's called a living will. So someone might say, I don't want to be kept alive artificially if there's no chance of recovery. And unfortunately with my brother, he had a living will that I drafted for him. And this did come into play for him uh, two days ago. I can't believe it. Uh, it it's, yeah, it's been an interesting rough time for us here. But uh, did come into play. He's, he's recovered uh, pretty much at this, you know, a lot from where he was there, but uh, we don't know what's gonna happen. But we had that document. He never expected to be in that situation, but he had it, 
he was prepared and we were prepared to do what he wanted. And uh, he was very, very clear. We're very, very close. And when you sign a, a healthcare proxy where you appoint someone else to make your healthcare decisions and a living will, what those decisions are, it's not enough to put it in writing. You really need to talk to that person and go over the nuances. And I knew exactly what my brother wanted and what he didn't want. And, uh, you know, it was, it, it was great being right in the mix and making sure I was doing the right thing. Um, okay. Uh, the next document, simple, last will and testament, where your assets go when you pass away. Now, from a planning point of view, you know, if you don't have a will, and I, it sounds crazy, but I know so many attorneys that don't have wills. It's just pretty nuts, but uh, they don't have a will. What happens if you don't have a will? There's a schedule in New York, and I'm sure in most states, uh, that sets forth where your assets go. In essence, the state drafts a will for you. That's what the administration process is when you don't have a will. New York State says, well, you know, if you have a spouse and children, the spouse gets the first 50,000 and then it's split 50-50. Is that good? Maybe. Is that bad? Maybe, you know, but don't let New York State, don't let California, don't let, your, don't let Illinois draft your will for you. You might as well draft your own will, set forth what you want. But then think about it. Within the will, we could do some planning. We could do estate planning. We could do credit shelter planning with, with, the, uh, with the will. Uh, we could have testamentary trusts, which obviously is a trust within the will. So we do that all the time. And within that will, we could do special needs trusts, uh, any type of trust that we would need. Uh, you know, and that really does make sense. And the last document, that I would say anybody that has any amount of means should have would be a living trust. Now, the living trust could be irrevocable. Typically, our Medicaid trusts are irrevocable. Our life insurance trust, you know, for estate planning, you know, we get a big life insurance policy out of an individual's taxable estate. So simple, but, you know, recently we got $6 million dollars of insurance out of someone's taxable estate. It's pretty easy. Uh, and, uh, you know, so it's so powerful and so important. Uh, and just really, I just urge everyone to make sure that you guys and your clients and uh, your family just have what they need. Uh, I'm here in New York. I practice exclusively in New York, but we have elder law attorneys uh, throughout the country that are really terrific. Kerry Peck from uh, Illinois being one of them. So those are the five documents that I'd say everyone really should have for so many reasons. Uh, so does anybody have any questions on that? Because it's a pretty small group and I'm happy to field any questions now. If not, I'll move on. Ron, it's Arnie. Um, Arnie? Uh, thinking of the living will and what's happening with COVID and ventilators, what is the relationship of putting someone on a ventilator where there may be a living will that says do not resuscitate, but uh, I mean, is, is the ventilator situation a, an asterisk that people need to think about? Um, and, you know, what's, what's your thoughts on that? Yes, uh, it definitely is something that you want to think about. A DNR is a do not resuscitate when you're not, not in good shape. You know, uh, you or family might sign a DNR, do not resuscitate. The DNR only involves the cardiopulmonary uh, parts of the body, not everything. So uh, when you're talking about a ventilator, that, that's pulmonary. Can't get more pulmonary than that, right? Which is where this, this machine is, is helping you breathe. Uh, so uh, you really have to set forth what your wishes are in a, uh, in a living will. Uh, but I think 
it's not just the ventilator per se. In New York, in the height of this, uh, they were saying that 25% of individuals that go on a ventilator were going to make it. And, uh, you know, it's a pretty low percentage. So my very good friend's wife uh, was on a ventilator for eight days. She had, the doctor said she had a 20% chance to live, and she did. And she's just about 100% now after six weeks, which was very, very good. Um, so you want to be very careful. If you're going to say, I don't want a ventilator because the odds aren't good, you know, look, it's not great when, when the weatherman says there's a 25% chance of sun, you're probably not going to run to the beach. Um, but when you're talking about your life, I, I, I would be a little, look, everybody is different. I, I would, I, I probably would opt to take a chance on that ventilator, at least that's me, but everybody is different. Ron, in the current estate, estate tax exemption expires on the last day of 2025, is that correct? Right after 2025, yeah. And it goes, what's the exact number at that point in time? Uh, it's gonna be half of whatever it's gonna be then. So right now, it started off, you know, like years ago, 600,000, when I started to really get into this, then now it's $11.85 million. So it's almost $12 million. So it's with inflation, let's say it's gonna be 12 million. It probably would be a little bit more. So it's, it's going to be half of that. So look, New York State has its own estate tax, and New York State is trying to keep up with federal. In New York State, we're close to 6 million. We're 5.85 million. So we're almost 6 million in New York. So uh, that, that's what it's going to be uh, at the end of 2025. Now, people are saying, what if Biden or a Democrat gets into office Maybe we're not going to wait till 2025. Maybe we're going to have that exemption had a lot sooner. I don't know. You know, don't forget under Obama, you know, we were at, I think, $2 million, and he pushed it to, to over five million, five and a quarter, I believe, at that time. Uh, so that was a pretty big push, you know, under Obama, you know, a Democrat. So you just never know. You never know. But... Look, this is what Trump did. And just like all of the personal benefits, those tax benefits under the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, uh, well, they all sunset the end of 2025. Along with that are, are the estate tax and estate and gift tax exemptions. So income tax rates as well will automatically by law go back to where they were at the end of 2025? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I don't want to say thanks, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do it. <laughs> Ron, I was going to... Yeah, yeah, just hop in. I mean, this I is great. Say, say hello. Uh, Hi. And the first thing I wanted to say is uh, I'm sorry uh, to hear about all these troubles that, that you've had and many of us had and wishing... Um, good outcomes for, for those those of you in your life who are dealing with, with these health issues. Um, I really do appreciate that. Thank you. I have a number of, of uh, very intense medical issues going on in my immediate family as well. So I'm uh, very, very appreciative of, uh, of your presentation. I think many of us are very practical and very important, always at all times, and all the more so, uh, Colbaomer, right, in a time like this where... Um, our relationship to, to death is a little bit different and to the dying process should be reevaluated. Re Just real quick on the merits, wanted to mention as the tax counsel in the group that uh, you made terrific points on the tax side, uh, really, really excellent job doing that. Um, and just wanted to point out a very small item that a lot of people forget when they're doing estate planning and setting up trust or setting up any of these instruments is the importance of thinking about who you're going to have as your tax POA. Uh, and I recommend typically that in addition to the 
formal POA instruments that the tax authorities have. So for the IRS, it would be the 2848. And for New York, it would be the uh, NYS PO, PO dash uh, slash one. And they've made actually at, the, at both of those government agencies, there have, there have been various changes in terms of making it easier for taxpayers to set those up by using electronic signatures um, and things like that. So that's very, very helpful. But I, I think that it's good practice and good form for clients when they're setting up these documents to also throw in, uh, you know, for, the, for the, uh, the, the council who's setting up these documents to throw in a tax uh, provision or two in terms of just appointment uh, because maybe that should be the healthcare proxy. Maybe it should be totally someone totally different. And to have those POAs executed ahead of time is not a bad idea. Um, sometimes you could be very general depending on which state is involved. Some states require a specific period set forth on those POAs. But those are just good things to uh, think about and add into the, into the mix. Anyways, that's all. Thank you. No, that's wonderful. And it's a very, very good point. And the person that you're going to name uh, to, to handle your finances and tax issues likely won't be the same person that you're going to name for your health care. Exactly. You know, it's, it's a different type of uh, person that you, you may want. You know, it depends. Every, everyone is very different. Uh, anything else? Oh, yeah, sure. Bill? I, I'm Bill from, from Santa Cruz and our estate planning documents in California. Um, and I know when, when, when my dad passed away a number of years ago, I discovered that even though you may have a power of attorney, getting it accepted by a bank and getting it accepted by you know, other institutions took time. And listening to um, you know, your, your story and just, you know, as you say, our, you know, our relationship to death and mortality is, you know, is... is is something that we need to consider a bit differently in this time. Are you advising people, let's say like myself or people who have done their planning, to begin to send out powers of attorney to banks and other places just to have things lined up so that people don't end up with, you know, weeks of argument with Bank of America okay. over their form or, you know, the probate form or my lawyer's form? What, what are you okay. suggesting? Well, well, you're bringing up a very good point. Uh, we have never advised the client to do that, but I will tell you that uh, the attorney that gets involved with this in New York City uh, for Citibank is on my speed dial. <laughs> so this is an issue all the time in New York. So seriously. So, uh, you know, banks in New York are supposed to. It's right in the general obligations law. They have to abide by the power, but there's no teeth in it. Yeah, uh, it's the same in California, yeah, I think. And in New York, I, I'm on a committee that's actually looking into this, and there's pending legislation that we're tweaking, and the, uh, the banks in New York actually have gone along with most of what we proposed, and we actually came to an agreement when COVID started to happen. But uh, we're going soon. We're going to have a new power of attorney law in New York that's going to do away with that st uh, statutory gifts rider. So the banks and all of their cohorts are actually uh, have agreed to all of our changes at this point. So uh, and there will be teeth. So if they don't abide by the power within a certain time frame, then they could be liable. And uh, so I think that's pretty good. Uh, but I have not advised clients to do that, Bill. I think it's a great idea. Uh, in New York, it typically only takes a, a telephone call because the individuals at the branch would say, no, no, no. They'll go to another branch, no, no, no. They'll go to the branch manager, no. They call us, we call the, the bank attorney. They say, what branch? Okay, I'll let them know, and then we're okay. So, you know, we just, we just haven't done what you said, but I think it's probably a good idea if they're willing to actually put that in their record someplace and have it on hand. If a bank is organi organized enough to, to do that and have it on hand for you, why yeah. not? You know, it's almost like a pre-approval. 
Right, exactly. And then the, the other thing which, which you didn't have on your list of the five or six documents that everyone should have, and I know it doesn't apply to all of us at this point, but, but what about, what are you advising people in terms of, you know, like setting up guardianships, you know, particularly because this goes through both parents could be either incapacitated or pass away. Are, are you adding to your list of documents, you know, what to, what to be doing with your kids? Uh, well, sure. If, if there are minor children, we definitely yeah. do that. And we do appoint a guardian, uh, oftentimes for a minor ch a child. Uh, in New York, the appointment of a guardian is still subject to uh, a court review. Uh -huh. um, just, you know, the thinking is, well, you could appoint someone who's, a, you know, sorry for this, but a child rapist. <laughs> you know, that person is not going to get passed by the court. Uh, but, and, you know, in my experience of over 40 years in doing this, um, you know, any time a client of mine has, has appointed somebody as a guardian, it worked and it was no issue. Yeah. But it's, it's a good point. And especially, you know, when we do wills for younger people, uh, you know, we, we have them appoint a guardian just in case the parents are in an accident or something like that uh, for minor children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, again, I think about Nick Cordero and uh, my son's wife was so into his wife and him and the whole story. And she followed the wife on, on the yoga sites and everything that she was doing. And, you know, she was devastated when he passed away. Uh, but he was 41. He has a, an infant, you know, and, and this virus for somebody who seemed so healthy and well. So, you know, we just have to take lessons from this virus, take it with us. Uh, and I think the statement, you know, that you said was, uh, you know, our, our relationship with death now, our perspective is very different than it ever was, you know, and, and mine certainly has changed as well. Any other comments or I'm just going to Yeah, change. Ron, it's, it's on. I just wanted to, first, I, I was remiss in not also acknowledging as uh, George did in terms of sort of just respect for your ability to do this seminar now with all that you've been confronting both yeah. in um, the family and elsewhere. And I think we're all appreciative of that. Um, sure, in, sure. In, in terms of, so on a substance, I couldn't tell whether you were, offering a hint about the handling of insurance policies um, and if there's anything particular um, where we might have, you know, you know, substantial term policies or life insurance, if there are things we should be doing with that um, other than the, the, the standard beneficiary arrangements that are made. Yeah. Yeah. And, and everyone, you know, it's a fairly small group. Feel free to chime in. We're all lawyers, right? So uh, that this is fine. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. With insurance policies, just like with any uh, asset that you have, look at the beneficiary designations just to make sure they're exactly what you want. Uh, you and I know it because we went to law school, but half of the population, really, that, they don't realize. You could have a will that says everything goes to child A, but you know, if you have a beneficiary designation, that says that account or that life insurance goes to child B, then it's gonna to go to child B, not child A. So you and I know it, but our clients really are very confused. They think that if you sign a will, it's gonna change the beneficiary designations. So number one, just I think it's a conversation to have with clients because they are confused about that. And number two, Arnie, I think really, you just want to look at all of the beneficiary designations. And if you're thinking about doing estate planning, this is where tax counsel feel free <laughs> to chime in because I am not a tax lawyer, but I do know uh, tax issues are relating to uh, uh, trust estates, elder law, and Medicaid. But I can certainly use some help. <laughs> so <laughs> this is fine. But, you know, with life insurance, you're, you're uh, uh, you really want to be careful on how you do have your designations, your beneficiary designations, because let's say you do want to disclaim a policy and you want to get it over to the next generation or whatnot, uh, who you name as a successor 
or, or tertiary uh, success or beneficiary could really mean a lot. So you really want to think about who the beneficiary designations, uh, you know, the beneficiaries are on the policies, how you set forth those designations. It might actually go into a trust, could be a standby trust that's created. The life insurance could then go into it. But what I was alluding to before was an ILIT, I-L-I-T, an irrevocable life insurance trust. My client recently, you know, has a decent amount of assets and had $6 million of life insurance. And, uh, you know, he sort of kind of refinan refinanced it. He, he just got a different policy every now and then when the rates went down and he wound up with $6 million. And uh, if you own that policy uh, at the time of death uh, or within three years of death, it's in your taxable estate, you know, and uh, you got to be very, very careful. So you want to get it out of the estate. How do you do it? You know, with a life insurance policy, there are three, you know, entities or individuals involved. There's an owner who owns the policy. There's the insured. Whose life is that? Is that policy, you know, on? That's the insured. And then it's the, the part that you and I would want to be is the beneficiary. You, you don't want to be the insured who dies. And who cares if you're the owner, if you're not going to be the beneficiary. So it's the owner, the insured, and the beneficiary. When we create this life insurance trust, the owner would actually transfer ownership of the policy to this irrevocable life insurance trust, getting it out of the estate. Uh, will we use up some of the exclusion in the transfer? Not if it's a term policy, but if there's cash value in the policy, it's, and it's, the number's tweaked a little bit, you know, it's called the interpolated value, but it's about the, the cash value, that would be deemed uh, or could be deemed a gift when it's transferred into the trust. Uh, but in my example, it was a six million policy with a couple of hundred thousand dollars in cash value. Like what a no brainer. So we got out almost $6 million that would have been taxed at about 50%. You know, federal at 40 and, and New York State goes up to 16%. So, you know, really important planning that was done. Did I answer your question, Arnie? I'm not sure. Absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly, that, that, was, that was what I wanted to understand. That good, good, right. good. Yeah, hey, Seth. Ron, thank you for this. It's great. Sure, thank you. Sorry about what's been happening uh, for you recently. Thanks so much. Um, I appreciate it. So a lot of small law firms and small companies will use insurance to uh, and sort of to fund a buy sell agreement or to fund that uh, payment of a partner if a partner were to pass away that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, does that figure into the estate planning? When, uh, well, the, the business and how it's set up figures into the estate plan, mm -hmm. uh, because at the end of the day, we got to figure out, you know, uh, what's going to wind up in the estate and do we have the taxable estate? So, yeah, I mean, how that's set up is very, very important, you know. So uh, we work very closely with tax counsel, business counsel, you know, uh, and it's, you know, the estate work that we do. But yes, the bottom line is what's going to wind up in the taxable estate uh, if there's a taxable estate. And, uh, you know, if, if clients are shy of it be, having a taxable estate, we may want asset values that are, are, are even higher because we would get a basis step up, a step up at the time of death, you know, and that could be, uh, you know, Apple stock, Apple hits new highs lately and or Tesla stock. Anybody have Tesla stock that, you know, gone, gone a little berserk lately, right? Uh, so large capital gains, when you die with Tesla stock, if you drop dead now, you know, it went up so much, you, you know, at the time of death, it gets revalued. It's part of your taxable estate, but the basis gets revalued at the time, time of death. Well, that could also happen with uh, shares of a, a business, you know, that you own. 
And uh, you could also get that basis step up as well. So all of these factors have to be taken into consideration. But yeah, how you set up that, that buy sell is, is really important from a, uh, an estate point of view. So the question is, what's, you know, who's going to die one way or the other? And what's going to wind up in each of our estates at the end of the day? Um, and the most important thing from a, you know, from a business point of view is you don't want third parties mingling, you know, mingling in, in, in a business situation uh, when, you know, the partners or family members know how the deal works and it's running like clock, clockwork. You don't want third parties to be in that mix unless, unless you really want them in the mix. Thanks, Ron. Sure, sure. Okay, so uh, any other questions or should I move on? Just, yeah. one, just one quick uh, random observation that popped into mind. Uh, with the COVID rules that have been enacted in light of uh, the CARES Act and some of the other legislation and regulations coming out of <laughs> Treasury, it's also possible to think about distributions from uh, deferred accounts and things like that and, and tie that into estate and, and tax planning as well and to leverage off uh, the tax benefits that are now written into law in terms of distributions. There are limitations and uh, in terms of amounts and things like that, but just wanted to add that uh, for reference uh, for all the colleagues out there and their clients. Right, right. And it's so interesting that you brought up that point. Very, very good point. Um, you know, uh, for, you know, estate tax purposes, you don't have to take distributions on your retirement accounts this year, right? So that's pretty cool. So, you know, the government says, well, your, 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 your assets probably went lower, even though the stock market is hitting new highs, more or less, I don't know about today per se, but, you know, generally, uh, and, uh, so you don't have to take distributions, but I also do planning for long-term care, but, and for Medicaid. I'm the one who changed the law on IRAs and Medicaid in New York State. And in New York, the IRA is exempt only if it's in payout status and you are taking your distributions. So, you know, you have to be very careful uh, because what might be good, see, this is why tax counsel and an elder law counsel really need to work together. So we should talk afterwards, <laughs> seriously. That sounds, that sounds good, Ron. That sounds no, good. but it's true because what you're saying is, of course, yeah, you know, it all makes sense. And you could tell someone, no, no, don't take it, just let it grow tax deferred. Were you crazy? And but from my point of view, what are you crazy? You just turned a, an exempt asset into an available asset that they're going to grab. So <laughs> it's it's funny. So you need all disciplines, which is why I love INBLF because we have everything. It is amazing. Uh, so anyway, this is wonderful. So uh, I just want to just talk about planning for long-term care as well. Uh, you know, one thing to plan, God forbid you become ill, you pass away. What if it's a long-term care event? Well, there's no good way to pay for long-term care in the United States. Medicare does not pay for long-term care. Uh, so you either could buy a long-term care policy, which would be pretty expensive. They're not that popular anymore. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to get for a lot of people because insurance companies uh, are, have very high standards, but that's one way to do it. What's the other way? Pay for it through the nose. What's the other way? you go on Medicaid. And so I think everyone, everyone should really think when you turn 50, 45, 50, I'm not saying to transfer all your assets away into a Medicaid trust and wait five years when you're 45 years old. But what I am saying is think about it. You know, maybe buy long-term care insurance. Uh, maybe, you know, you make a lot of money, just, you know, privately pay for it. In New York, the average cost of a nursing home in New York City per month is around 18000 a month. Uh, so it's pretty high. Uh, 20000 is not unheard of at all. 
Uh, clients on a vent bed, we're talking about ventilators, in New York is about $32,000. Sometimes it's for a long-term care situation and you need a vent for a while and, you know, getting Medicare to cover it, they should cover it with supplemental insurance for the over 65 crowd, but uh, you have to plan for long-term care. So number one, could be private pay. If you have enough money, that's fine. If you, if you know what you're getting into, uh, long-term care insurance, or as you get older, and there's ways to do this where the bite is not too bad, we could set up an irrevocable Medicaid asset protection trust, have assets transferred to that uh, uh, trust. The individual could receive income, not supposed to receive principal directly, but there are ways that they could actually also use the, uh, uh, the principal if need be, but that's a bit complicated. But uh, doing that sort of planning is very, very important. Uh, I mean, I do this all the time and people think that they're not gonna be hit with, with long-term. Let me just give you a stat. 60% of uh, individuals, in, in 60% of the 65 plus crowd will spend some time in a nursing home. And as I just told you, the average cost, at least in New York City, is about 18,000 a month. So you just want to be prepared for that. Many times, uh, younger clients come to me and say, well, I'm not going to give away, you know, I'm 65 and I'm vibrant and I'm 65, 70. I don't want to give away all of my money, but we break it down. They might have a home valued at a million dollars, uh, IRAs valued at 700,000. Maybe they have uh, 600,000 in other assets. Just give you an idea. We could transfer the home into a Medicaid trust. They could live in it for their lifetime. The home could be sold. We preserve the 121A exclusion, the $250,000 uh, per individual. You know, when, when you sell a home, 500,000 for a husband and wife, capital gains tax exclusion if the home is sold. We preserve all of that in the irrevocable trust and they get to live in the home. It could be sold. And so they only put the home in the trust. In New York, IRAs after my case is exempt. So they're going to keep those IRAs. And so let's say they have another five, 700,000. Maybe they keep that, that amount of money. But I'm giving this situation, th this example, so you get a sense that Medicaid planning in a situation where somebody has a million dollar home, 700,000 in IRAs, and 600,000 in other assets, well, if we take care of the home, the IRAs, we're not going to do anything with those IRAs, uh, you know, until age 72, unless we have to. And for Medicaid, they do need to be in payout status, but we could do it right then and there, and that's what we would do. So now we're going to wait till age 72. So we just got out, got out a million seven for Medicaid. The individual still has 600,000. You know, we could worry about that later on. And even if they needed a nursing home at the very last minute, in New York and in virtually all states, we can do a plan that's called the rule of halves. We could actually protect half of those assets at the very last minute. So in my example, you might say, well, someone has over $2 million. We're not talking Medicaid. Well, by transferring that home into the trust, getting it out with the IRAs. Well, since I changed the law in New York state and it's different in different states, uh, the, the IRAs are going to be exempt whenever they, the, the IRA is put in payout status, which could be done at the last minute. And the other assets, the 600,000 could always be uh, 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 kept and we could preserve half even at the last minute and maybe all, there's so many different ways to do things. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, it, doing Medicaid planning doesn't always mean just giving everything that you have away and feeling like you, you can't go to the early bird special because you don't have enough money. <laughs> yeah, hey, Seth. 
So, Ron, is this an argument against long-term care insurance? No, 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 no. I think it's great. I have long-term care insurance, uh, which is good. But, you know, long-term care insurance is great. Not everyone could afford it. And you should be aware. I mean, I was taken off, you know, off guard here. I got my insurance about 20 years ago. Wonderful policy. So about 10 years ago, John Hancock decided to raise the premiums. What do you think they wanted to raise it to? Double it. Then they, you know, a couple of years later, it was a 20% increase on what was already double. Uh, yes, I could really water down my benefits. But I didn't want to water down my benefits because I see this day in and day out with what I do. So, I mean, look. Uh, but a lot of those policies have, have fixed premiums. I mean, you can buy a fixed premium policy, which I You can buy a fixed premium policy, however, the, the, they, the insurance companies do have the right to raise rates, not just on you, Seth, if you need the insurance, but for everyone in the class, they need to get approval from, since we're in New York, the New York State Insurance Department. And the New York State Insurance Department granted the okay to John Hancock each of the three times they wanted to do this for me with my policy. Uh, why? because there wasn't enough money in the till for reserves because they didn't work out their numbers right. You know, so I'm a little pissed off at the insurance companies because, you know, they didn't do their numbers right. It was inherently flawed the way they did it. Uh, so, no, no, it's not a knock on long-term care insurance. I love it, but, uh, and I'm glad I have it, but I'm paying, you know, through the nose for it. Yeah. So a lot of my clients, you know, if a client is 75 years old, I probably won't have them buy long-term care insurance. It's going to be so expensive. We'll just do the Medicaid planning unless they have a lot of money and then they'll, they'll just, you know, self-insure. So what age are you thinking um, would you recommend that people start thinking about long term care insurance or the moving things into a Medicaid trust? I mean, what is the age range that you would usually counsel, you, you know, people that came into your office about that? Sure. That, you know, Marcy, that's a really good question. Uh, I would say 45-ish, 50 for long-term care insurance because it's so much cheaper. And then when they do the increases, at least you're working from a very low level. I'm working from a very low level. Uh, so Mark said he just had to leave. So uh, thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. Uh, so great. Thank you. Thanks. Nice seeing you. Uh, so I would say 45, 50 for long-term care insurance, uh, which is good. As far as doing the Medicaid planning, I'd say 60 plus. So, you know, good time to start to think about that. Great. Good. So I know it's four o'clock. Boy, as far as I'm concerned, time flew. But uh, Thanks so much for coming, listening, having me. I really do appreciate it.